In the morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to St. Mark Bemidji's podcast, the podcast that changes out the soap on your sink when it gets too small to use. This podcast is about redemption through the glory of Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. Thank you for listening today. You are the reason I do this program, because I want you to know Jesus, and by faith in Him, that I will get to spend eternity standing next to you, worshiping Him. This program, like many other modern podcasts, is a value-for-value podcast. We send you the value of content for free, without a paywall or a subscription or giving up your personal information while creating an account. The amount of value you receive is entirely up to you. If you thought it was terrible, well, you're only out a few minutes of your time. But if you thought it was great, we'd like you to take that value and pass it along. You see, we don't want your money. We want you to spread the love that we receive from God free and give it to someone else who also most desperately needs it. And the best part is that when you give God's love away, you somehow haven't lost anything. In fact, you may have gained more than you started with. A true miracle. So if you like this podcast, share it with a friend. There are lots of ways to do it, including taking a look at the show notes and copying the address from Buzzsprout down and giving it to someone else, hitting the share button in your in modern podcast app. There's all sorts of ways to do it. Do you need help doing it? Send me an email at john.kirk at stmarksbemidji.org and I'll help you do it. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Today, our meditation comes to us from our home church here in Bemidji. It's titled, Christ the Cornerstone. It's based on this reading from Romans chapter 9 and 10. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? A righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And now, for today's sermon. May God bless our time together today, meditating on His Word. In the name of Christ Jesus, our cornerstone on whom our faith is built. Amen. I thought about setting something up like this uh, as a a children's lesson for this morning, but the irony would have been tangible. You all familiar with a Rube Goldberg machine? Seen those things that there's like 20, 30 different steps, and it's silly you know, uh, it's all to like pour a glass of orange juice or crack an egg. And you know what they look like. There's a, maybe starts with a golf ball that's plinking down a little ramp and then it hits another one and it rolls into something else and it sets off a bowling pin and it knocks over the 10 pins and then the last one falls down and it hits a spatula and it cracks the egg and it lands in the frying pan. While it's goofy and while Rube Goldberg was a, a cartoonist uh, many years ago, he developed these, these things as a kind of a means of entertainment, and they're often interesting to watch all the different steps as they progress, but the Rube Goldberg machine it serves as a pretty solid example of our human, innate human ability to overcomplicate things. To overcomplicate things when they need not be. This might be a result of overthinking a situation or assuming somebody has an ulterior motive. So they say, good morning to you, and you're kind of like, well, what do they mean? 
Or another example is, not to single you out, ladies, but say your husband comes home and he's got a bouquet of flowers. What is your first thought? Not, oh, thank you, sweetheart. What do you want? Or what did you do? We overcomplicate our own relationships in, in multiple different ways. And to be totally fair, I mean, sometimes we have those assumptions, we have those gut instincts for a reason. Because we're sinners. And we live in a sinful world. And we are sinful people ourselves. And it's not just I who have been wronged. It is I who have been wronged and I have wronged others. And we set these stumbling stones in front of one another time and time and time again. And so sometimes those assumptions are justified because we can't just naively ignore certain patterns of behavior. But the point is, either way, we overcomplicate our relationships with one another because we're sinful people. But the worst thing is when we overcomplicate our relationship with the Lord. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Rome. He sets up this interesting juxtaposition between the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and the Jewish people. He begins by saying this, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. The Gentiles did not pursue righteousness. Well, what does he mean by that? He means they didn't pursue righteousness as like something that they could attain as a means by which that they could garner God's favor. They didn't even have the Ten Commandments as a people. They didn't have the ceremonial law. They didn't get the instructions for the tabernacle or for the temple. Rather, they had a religion or religions that, yes, demanded sacrifice, that, yes, demanded offerings, that, yes, demanded virtue, but it was a quid pro quo, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, relationship between the human and the divine. And the thought must have dawned on them as Paul is preaching to them. You see a great example in, uh, when Paul is in Athens in the book of Acts where he starts to speak with them and he begins to reason with them. And the thought dawns on them that if God is really God, then what does he need this goat for? What does he need the statue of gold or the temple for? What does he need human food and offerings for? In all these gods that we serve, like Zeus and Hera and Athena, divine though they may be, they all have human problems. The same problems I do. They're all equally as awful. Murderers, adulterers, slanderers, liars, tricksters. They're not really divine. If the divine is truly divine, then He doesn't need any of those things, and He is really not like that. When Paul and the others preached the Gospels to the Gentiles, they saw this to be true. They knew they couldn't pursue righteousness. They knew that doing so many good works was never going to garner God's favor in that way. Rather, the opposite. And so when Paul and others came and told them the plain, simple, cornerstone, bedrock truth, that the divine has done it for you. That the price for sin in all the evil of the world was laid on one person's shoulders. And he bore it. He sacrificed it. No strings attached. They believed the message. They glommed onto it. That's really divine. What we had was nothing. This is the message. This is the righteousness from God to me. Not a righteousness that I earn. On the other hand, Paul sets up what the Jewish people had been saying. He said the, the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? 
because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Israel had been led and fed and provided for. They had been given the promised land in which they were dwelling. They had been delivered from their enemies multiple times and restored. They heard the voice of God Himself booming out from the top of Mount Sinai. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the instructions for the tabernacle and the temple. They had their ceremonial law. But as we saw in the Gospel for today, what did they do with it? They turned it into a laundry list of rules and regulations that you must do, otherwise God won't love you. They had turned the whole thing on its head. They had taken the law and they had used it for a wrong purpose to try to gain or earn righteousness. In Sunday school, or excuse me, in catechism class, I use this simple illustration, uh, if I have any catechumens in here that remember it. What is the purpose of the law? S-O-S, what does that stand for? What is the purpose of the law? Show our sin. The law's purpose is to show our sin, to make us cognizant of it. Because when we look at it, we get to number one and say, you shall not have any other gods. And in my heart of hearts, I know that I've set up 101 things between me and the Lord on a momentary basis. I cannot keep that. I cannot do it on my own. Doesn't mean I just throw it out and say, throw up my hands and say, well, I'm not even going to try. But I know that I will stumble and I know that I will fall. Because we are all sinful people. Whereas the former pagan Gentiles knew that the, if the divine was really divine, there was no working into God's good graces. The Hebrews, on the other hand, the Jewish people, saw themselves as this highly favored, chosen nation. And Paul says they were zealous for God, but their zeal was not based in knowledge. They wanted to establish their own standard of righteousness. Something that made sense to them. A righteousness that existed by works. And so when Christ comes along in this message that it's all been done for you, The law has been kept and fulfilled. As he says in the end, Christ is the what? The culmination of the law. Everything is resting on Him. When they come to that teaching, it doesn't jive with their natural human thinking. It doesn't jive with human thinking, period. Because we work for our food. We work to put clothes on our back. We work to put a roof over our head. God is different. God works by free and faithful grace. God sets Himself apart from the rest of the world. And it's really, really simple. We don't work to garner God's favor. God favors us and loves us more than we could ever possibly imagine. Now to bring this home and into our own day, you might be wondering, well, Where do I fit? Am I more of a a, a Jewish uh, mentality or am I more a Gentile mentality? And the answer is kind of both depending on the day. Now you and I might say, you know, I was brought to faith in Jesus. I I don't reject Jesus. But we have the same overcomplicating, stumbling sinful natures that existed in the hearts of God's people of ancient times too. The verse that Paul quotes here about the cornerstone highlights the fact that everything simply hinges on and is built upon what Christ has done. However, like the Jews who rejected Jesus because they believe that the path to God was through following God's laws, we often try to earn our salvation. Let me give you an example. We often say, well, yeah, I go to church on Sunday. I go to church every single Sunday and I put my offering in the plate and I love my spouse and I try to train my kids and bring them up right and I'll help an old lady across the street. All those things are wonderful and good until, until in our heart of hearts we think that those things somehow earn God's love for us. All those things are great on their own until we think that because I do them, God loves me. And there's a really, really fine line there. We're so steeped in sin that sometimes we don't even realize that we are attempting to pave 
our own path. We think that our actions are a response to God's love. But then on the other hand, when something tragic happens and we find ourselves in some sort of trouble, we get angry and bitter towards God. Like, well, wait a minute. If I've done all those things, if I've been a good person, if I've been a good Christian, if I've given my offering, if I've done all this stuff, then why is my relationship broken? Then why is my health falling apart? Then why is this, that, or the other thing happening? When I faithfully go to church, when I help the poor, when I pray, when I study my Bible, we think God owes us something. That's paganism. The idea that I can do something for God to make Him love me, that is distinctly Baal worship. I offer this goat and I get a good harvest. What is truly divine is the fact that He's already given us the greatest gift beyond our understanding. And yeah, sometimes He allows us to suffer in a whole bunch of different ways. Why? It's to put you on your knees so that you can examine your foundation, your cornerstone, a little more closely. To help us trust in Him even more. When the Rube Goldberg machine of our life is broken and falling apart, when it's skipped a step or three and the ball drops on the floor and our way doesn't work out the way we want it to, we are reminded, we are reminded clearly of the one who controls all things. We are reminded clearly of the one who calls us to set our faith on him who is the cornerstone. Because we have the same natural human sinful hearts that looks at Christ with human eyes and sees something broken there. You know, why do why do believers not why excuse me, why do unbelievers not believe? Unbelievers don't believe because they look at Christ and they see that he's broken. That's defeat. That's not victory. He's sacrificed for the sins of the world. That's kind of cheap, isn't it? Doesn't that kind of mean that I can go and do whatever it is I want? Or a sense of perceived value gets in the way? That's cheap grace. But the truth is, if somebody ever says that to us, the price was paid and the price was great. This isn't cheap grace. This was not easy. It was paid. He was broken. And that one was the blood of the innocent and holy Son of God. And His blood covers the entire human race. One, my own death wouldn't pay for a single sin. In fact, even worse, an eternity in hell wouldn't satisfy God's judgment wouldn't satisfy His justice for a single sin. How many sins do we rack up during the day? Do we take a look at the Ten Commands to see how often we've broken them? How how many times we have not been a good spouse or a good parent or a good neighbor? And we pile those things up, we realize quickly how much we need a Savior, how much we need the cornerstone that has been given to us. And yes, He looked more broken. He looked more broken and defeated on the cross than any of us will in our lifetime. And to those that look at Him with just purely human eyes, He is the broken cornerstone that can't support anything to human eyes alone. But there's an irony here. Because those human eyes Our sinful nature is the same thing that thinks it is the master of its own destiny. How can it? You know, when you ever see those, uh, um, a Rube Goldberg machine go off on on YouTube? Somebody sets one up and, like, sometimes they're really cool. They, like, stretch throughout their whole house. I remember in high school, we had a competition to see who could build the biggest one. And when the the final act happens, when the egg cracks in the pan, or when the glass of orange juice gets poured, what do the people who build it do? 
They jump up and down. They're excited. They're elated. It worked! (laughs) I can't believe it worked! Because more often than not, the ball does fall off. Right? How many takes does it take to get one to work? Everything happens, has to happen just perfectly, one right after the other. We're not in control. It doesn't work that way. The same human eyes that judge Jesus to be a defective cornerstone must also see should be obvious that we're playing a losing game. Right? Just think of it. Purely from a human perspective, we are playing a losing game like me and golf. I'll have one good shot and think I'm God's gift to the game followed up by six awful ones that eventually culminates in chipping it into a sand trap or the drink. That is really the nature of of things. We are playing a losing game. Life is short. It's overcomplicated. And then you die. And that's putting it nicely. That's what human eyes see. How can anybody delude themselves into thinking that we have some amount of control over this whole thing? This is what Paul calls us to. This is why he sets up the juxtaposition between the, the Gentiles and between the Jews so that we can see our cornerstone. We can see who He is. That we have the assurance, bedrock assurance, in the face of guilt and trouble and death itself. That there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness for the worst sin. There is forgiveness for the most repetitive sin. There is hope when life looks hopelessly overcomplicated and lost and I'm questioning why everything is going on. That as I set my eyes on the cross and I look at them through not human eyes, but through the eyes of faith, I do see a broken cornerstone. But it was God's plan in that defeat to give you and me victory. That even if the worst should happen, that we have this assurance That just as He faced that trial and just as He faced that suffering and death, that if the worst should happen for you and that cold stream of death should or you roll on that day, you will be in paradise with the Lord. Christ is this cornerstone. The simplest message of God given grace that even a little child can understand. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's it. That is the bedrock upon which all of this is built. This is where I rest my faith. This is where I come and I put my guilt. This is where I come and I put my trouble. Not just me, but everybody. All believers. Trust in the Lord. Not in our own overcomplicated Rube Goldberg machines. Not in our own rules and our own regulations. Not in the love that we show. Not in the the good things that we do. Trust in the Lord when it all seems like it's too much. Trust in the Lord with a childlike faith. Trust in the Lord when it all seems overcomplicated. Look down at the simple cornerstone upon which your faith and your hope is built. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I sincerely pray that today's meditation on God's Word has enriched you. Didn't get enough of God's Word? Are you missing out on that in-person fellowship? We hold divine services right here in Bemidji, Minnesota at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday school and adult Bible study is also offered between our Sunday services at 9.15 a.m. We also live stream our Sunday divine service at 8 a.m. You can ensure that you are notified when a stream is live or a new podcast is available by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's easy to find by typing in St. Mark Bemidji in the search bar and clicking on the subscribe button. Want to listen to meditations the way I do every day? Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Go to podcastindex.org and search for St. Mark Bemidji to find us. This is our fifth year producing this podcast, and there is a large archive of devotional material online available if you want to learn more about God and His Word. 
visit www.stmarksbemidji.org or look in the show notes in this podcast for a link to this and many other meditations on God. If you have any questions or you would like more information about our church and its ministry, please visit our website, which is once again, www.stmarksbemidji.org. May God bless the rest of your day.